John chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. And I'll be reading from the King James Version. John chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them until the end. And supper being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God, and went to God. He riseth from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, I come to you this morning to say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this preaching opportunity. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I want to preach from the title this morning. It's time to wash some feet. It's time to wash some feet. Here in the text, we're about to witness a lesson on humility. Men and women haven't been serving God for many years, but has not yet learned the obedience of being humble. During Jesus' time, foot washing was a task for servants not for wealthy or the noble people. Masters did not wash the feet of their servants. It was the task for the lesser. Now I can imagine that people's feet were very dirty and probably hard and thick skin and not too attractive to the eye, amen. But not like anything like the primped and pedicured feet that we see on, you know, every day when we put our little sandals on. I'm hiding mine right now because I need one, amen. <laughs> but in those days, People wore sandals and many went without footwear. And if you have ever worn a pair of sandals for a day in the park or where there was considerable dust or dirt or walk barefoot on a dirt road, you can imagine how the feet of people looked. People's feet were constantly getting soiled from day-to-day -day activities. Foot washing was a full-time job for the service. I, I can't imagine wanting to wash somebody's feet. Amen. But Jesus does not explain that occasion why he was washing the apostles' feet. But he tells Peter, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will after this. Uh, the understanding here is that Jesus was teaching a lesson in humility. Amen, somebody. See, you don't yet understand what he said. You don't yet understand that I am teaching you humility. But after this, you should see me ascending into heaven. Then you will know that he who humbled himself and washed your feet is the same one who ascended into heaven. Then you will understand that my power and majesty are not diminished in the slightest when I display humility. And having learned that humility elevates one to the heights, you too will embrace it. In other words, I need you to just trust me in this lesson that I'm about to teach you. And given that Jesus' purpose in washing the apostles' feet was to demonstrate his humility towards man. And I don't think he was declining to wash Judah's feet along with the others would have accorded with his purpose. Amen, somebody. Because as I said, read just a little earlier in the text, that the devil had already placed it on Judah's heart to betray Jesus. But yet Jesus said, wash your feet too. Amen. You're going to learn something from that. Hold on to that for a second. But after all, he had the power to decline the crucifixion, but submitted himself not only to the one who betrayed him, but even to those who committed the physical act after begging forgiveness for them as they were in the midst of committing that sin. Amen. That, that's a lesson by itself, all by itself. See, see, we got to learn that even though you hurt me, even though you slay me, I'm still going to love you and treat you with some respect. I know it's hard. I know it's hard. I go through it all the time. 
I get slain on a daily basis. Trust me when I tell you this. But I still got to trust God. I still have to trust the process. I still have to humble myself. Even when I don't feel like it. But here he tells us in the text. What we must learn from his labor. When Jesus rose from supper. Wrapped the towel around his body. And washed the feet of his disciples. He was performing an act of selfless service. For his men. What Jesus did. Has a lot to teach us about becoming. A people of the towel. Amen somebody. See several facts present themselves to us in these verses. Washing feet was slaves' work. Even Jewish servants could not be forced to wash their master's feet. It was a task reserved for the lowest of the Gentile slaves. Sometimes a child would wash a parent's feet, a wife would wash the feet of her husband, or a friend would wash a friend's feet in a display of extreme affection, so Jesus took the place of a slave before his disciples. He willingly humbles himself to meet a need in the lives of his men. Jesus washed the feet of his disciples without even being asked to do so. Amen, somebody. In fact, they were probably shocked when Jesus began to wash his feet. Wash their feet. It was a breach of hospitality to fail to wash a guest's feet. Amen. The disciples should have been falling all over one another to wash his feet. But it never entered their minds to serve him. And apparently they were all waiting for someone to serve them. We got some nerve, don't we? We waiting for somebody to take care of us. But in reality, we ought to be taking care of somebody else. Jesus served with no expectation of reward. No one even said thank you. He did what he did just because he wanted to do it. He wasn't looking for the thank you, although it would have been nice. Jesus served the others with a willing heart. No one had to twist his arm. He voluntarily took the place of a slave and he served his men. Jesus served those who did not deserve to be served. Think about it. He washed the feet of Simon Peter. Before the night would end, those feet were set at a Roman fire as Peter denied Jesus three times. He washed the feet of Judas. His feet had already carried him to the Jewish leaders where he bargained away the life of Jesus for a few pieces of silver. But before the night would end, those same feet would carry him back to the Jews where he would completely abandon Jesus to his enemies. Jesus washed the feet of the other ten before the night would and all of those feet would run away in fear. Jesus knew all of this, yet he served them. Anyway, now I don't know about you. That's a hard thing to do. Especially when you already know what they're going to do to you. Amen. We don't know what other people going to do to us. And we still <laughs> don't want to serve them. Amen. In verse 5, it says that Jesus began to wash and to wipe. When he washed and wiped the feet of disciples, both those verbs are intense that speaks of continual, ongoing activity. In other words, Jesus kept at the task until it was completed. He worked until every dirty foot had been cleansed. Jesus did what he did for a specific reason. And while he was, uh, while he had his men were celebrating the Passover, the disciples were occupied with other matters. While they were in the upper room that night, Jesus was occupied with the waiting matters of eternity. He knew that before that night ended, he would go to his cross. He would labor in prayer before his father. He knew that Judas was going to betray him. He knew that the Romans would arrest him and put him on trial. He knew that in the next 24 hours would pass. 
he would be condemned, rejected by his people, beaten, crucified, buried. He knew that he would bear the sins of his people on Calvary and die in, the, in their place. His mind carried all these burdens, but still he wanted to serve his men. And while Jesus carried the burden of the loss on his heart, his men were worried far more about trivial matters. And in verses 24 through 30 tells us that they were arguing about who should be the greatest among the disciples. Jesus used this opportunity to teach them what being a true servant was all about. Most of us are like the disciples. They, there are very few, few who truly possess a servant's heart. Most are willing to be served, but not too many are willing to serve others. And like Jesus, we should be willing to serve others regardless of the cost. We must be willing to humble ourselves and do whatever is necessary to serve others. Someone has to do the nasty work. Amen, somebody. We must learn to serve without having to be asked. I have a problem asking somebody to help me when you already know what needs to be done. I have a problem asking for help because you know I already need some help. So I just have to do what I have to do with a servant attitude so I can get it done and be thankful to God that he gave me the strength and the peace to do it. We must learn to serve others willingly with no thought of reward. We shouldn't be worried about what I'm going to get. Come on, because you probably ain't going to get nothing. You can't get what you're worth. Amen. So just go ahead and do it anyhow. Whose praise would you rather have that of men or that of God? Come on. We must learn to serve those who are selfish and who refuse to serve. We must teach the next generation how to serve. Teach them by encouraging them to be more involved in service. Teach them by being an example. See, there is much we can learn from our Lord's labor. He served others and set a standard for us that we should strive to reach in our own service. That is one step toward us becoming the people of the tower. Amen. How can I be the people of a tower when I don't feel like anybody care about how I feel? How can I be a people of the tower if somebody turn their nose up if I walk to them to help them out? How can I be a people of the tower? But let me just back up for a moment. Here's what struck me. Judas was heavily influenced by Satan if not possessed at this point. But Judas was present for Jesus to wash his feet. And I find this humbling and encouraging. Uh, yes, because even though Jesus knew Judas was going to betray him, Jesus served him. Jesus knew what was in Judas' heart. He knew the betrayal was coming. Jesus knew the anguish that was coming, the beatings, the scourging, the agonizing walk to Golgotha, and the ultimate torture, the cross. But yet, even in this moment of humbling himself, Jesus washed Judas' feet. This man, Judas, who was pivotal in fulfilling the scripture and prophecies about the suffering servant, he sat there and allowed Jesus to wash his feet. Jesus humbled himself and served his greatest enemy. Can I be real? I, I don't know about you, but, but I have trouble in serving my closest loved ones sometimes. Amen. It is difficult to humble myself, to serve, and to put other needs before my own. I can't fathom putting a backstabber's needs in front of my own. It's a lesson right here. But at the same time, that is what I am. I am the backstabber. I am the portrayal. I am the one who put Jesus on the cross. Come on, y'all. It is our sin that put Jesus there. So how many times have we turned from God's grace to live, act, be, and do what we want out of our own selfishness, but Jesus served us by going to the cross? I know it'd be quiet. 
See, this is humbling because of our sin, but encouraging because of how much Jesus loved us. And even though Jesus knows us, he served us. Even though Jesus knows that we would betray him, he still went to the cross willingly. Jesus knows all about us. But yet, he says, I walk with you. I talk with you. I hold you when you need to be held. I'm there in the midnight hour. Even though you didn't acknowledge me this morning when you woke up, I still am there to serve you. John 13 and 14 says, if then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Here is my example. I am to serve, love, and do for others like Jesus did for me. I am to put down my own needs, my own pride, and serve others, even those who will betray me. And even those who would turn their backs on me, I am to love and serve our Lord and teacher Jesus Christ as he loved and served me. Brothers and sisters, I have good news and I got some bad news. The bad news is that feet stink. Amen. And if you're going to wash feet, you're going to do some humbling things and some humiliating things. And you're going to be involved in some situations that aren't very nice or popular or that aren't going to be seen by the masses. You aren't necessarily going to be applauded for what you're doing. But the good news is there's a great reward for the foot washers. You're blessed if you do these things. See, see, the main purpose of foot washing is caring for others cleansing us in a sin-cursed world, and to emulate Jesus in everything we do. As long as there are genuine emotions behind the act, the service is to others will bring feelings of humility and empathy. It is a beneficial act for both parties. See, three reasons why we ought to wash those dirty feet, because Jesus did it, because dirty feet need some washing, and because we're blessed when we do it. Amen, somebody? But here is my whole sermon in one sentence. Followers of Jesus distinguish themselves through humble, <clears throat> through humble acts of service to those who don't expect it and are unable to repay it. Amen. Foot washing is a distinctive mark of the followers of Jesus Christ. I only have one question left, and it is very simple. Jesus said, do as I have done. My question to you is this. Whose feet are you going to wash this week? It's time for us to move away from the theory and get over into the practice. It's time for us to move away from talk and get over into the action. You see, if all you do is just say, well, Pastor Bruce, this was a nice sermon, and you walk out of here and it doesn't change you and affect you, you might as well not have been here at all. But Jesus didn't say, Blessed are you if you know what I know. Jesus said, blessed are you if you do what I do. How did Jesus do it? He saw a need and he moved to meet it. He didn't wait for an invitation. He looked, took an initiative. He looked off, or took off his uniform of greatness. And he got down on his knees. He didn't announce what he was going to do. He didn't stand up and say, well, man, gee, I'm Jesus, and now I'm going to wash your feet. He didn't wait for a thank you, and he didn't receive one either. That is what a servant does. He sees the need, and he moves to meet it. So just remember this. It all starts in the heart. And I'm going to give you some suggestions, but I'm halfway scared to. See, you'll hear my suggestions, and you'll think that a servant... <laughs> must do something. So servanthood begins with an attitude of the heart. 50 ways to wash feet. Amen, somebody. I'm going to give y'all 50 ways to wash some feet this morning. Here are some of them. The first one, run an errand for free. Bake a cake for somebody that's shut in. Open your home for somebody who's in need. Give $20 with a note of encouragement to a single mom. Confront a friend who has strayed away from the Lord. Pick up somebody 
and take them to church or give them the Zoom link for Bible study. Make a tape recording for the blind. Come on. Hug somebody. Refuse to repeat gossip. Send some flowers to a friend. Buy some food for the food pantry. Clean up the kitchen so your wife can read the paper. Compliment somebody. Keep a secret you really like to share. Spend Saturday helping somebody. Break some leaves for a senior citizen. Change the oil for a friend's car. Uh, make some supper for a new mom. Bake an extra loaf of bread for your child's teacher or their administrator. Visit a nursing home. Type up and help a student that's going through some rough times. Counsel somebody who's pregnant and doesn't know what to do. Invite a college student over for Sunday dinner. Volunteer to serve in a nursery. Come on. Wash some windows at the church. Amen, somebody. Read a book to a child. These are just some suggestions. The heart is what matters. Because if you're doing it for the wrong reason, don't do it. Don't even waste your time. If you have the right kind of heart, you will find 10,000 times, 10,000 opportunities this week to wash some dirty feet. But I stopped by here to just let you know. The some of y'all can't wash somebody else's feet because they got some bad feet. See, somebody got some athlete's feet up in here. Run around like you're doing something. Amen, somebody. It ain't doing nothing, just running and running. Some of y'all got some heel spurs on your feet. You just stuck where you at. You can't get around, you can't do nothing. But Lord knows about the people with them car toes because those are the folk that tear up everything. Amen, somebody. I want the servant that has the bunions, the corns, and the blisters. You've been out in the vineyard and you've been late. You've been out there so long, you still ain't tired yet. You said, Lord, what else do you want me to do? Lord, what else can I do for you? Well, I can tell you what you can do for me. You can go out here and act like you are a servant of God. You can act like you're not afraid to touch somebody that's sick. You can act like you're not afraid to pray for somebody. You're not afraid to help somebody. Those are the kind of people that Jesus is looking for. It's time, y'all, to wash some feet. It's time to wash some feet. It's time to pull out that old basin and get down on your knees and help somebody out. Amen? Amen. Amen. Stand to your feet.